Okay, listeners, well, we love the fact that you guys like to check out what is new on demand and on DVD and and Blu-ray here in Australia. And there's a brand new film that's just out called House VHS. So we figured we'd get the director on the line today to talk all about this great new film. Welcome to the program, Gautier. Thank you. Hi, Doug. Go ahead, tell us a little bit about this film, because it's an absolutely fantastic film that I've had the pleasure of seeing down to watch. Tell us a little bit about ha- House of VHS. Um, it's a um, kind of a haunted house film um, that I wanted to do because it allowed us to do a kind of small budget film because we only had one location and a few characters, and we took the genre of the haunted, ha- haunted house film, and instead of having monsters or ghosts, we decided to focus it on a haunted VCR with kind of magical VHS tapes. And I had this idea um, one day when I was uh, watching a garage full of boxes and each box was full of VHS tapes and I thought that's probably a a thousand universes stacked in one garage and what would happen if all these universes merged and if they had a life of their own. So that was the, the premise of the film. Well, it's an absolutely fantastic premise. Can you tell us a little bit, are you a VHS lover? Because it comes across in this film that you may be a VHS lover. I, I definitely grew up on VHS because I'm, uh, I'm what, 34 years old. So uh, when I was a kid, I had, we had our first VCR when I was probably four years old. And I did all my uh, film education through VHS. So I, I watched every every single classic film on VHS with the, the old pan and scan format and in, in horrible conditions before I discovered DVD when I was probably almost 20. So uh, I definitely have a, a very uh, personal connection to VHS and it's a, it's a format that I'm very fond of because uh, it allows us to experience films in a way that's uh, a, a bit twisted because you see the film not in the format that it was intended to be shown in but in something a bit more personal and, and that triggers a lot more memories than watching it in the clean DVD or Blu-ray version, I think. Yeah, exactly. And what kind of movies did you grow up watching? <laughs> well, when I was a kid, I was a lot into the, uh, the Zorro movies. So I watched a lot of, of uh, kind of B versions of Zorro with uh, Zorro versus the Three Musketeers and uh, kind of, of crazy uh, crossovers that we could find on VHS and that were sold exactly next to the big budget movies. And there was no discrimination. You could get the last blockbuster, you could get Ghostbusters, and right next to that you had Zorro versus the Three Musketeers. So I grew up on, on all kinds of, of weird movies from, from a young age like that. Okay, now you just mentioned before, of course, that this film only had the one location. Did you have that in mind when you wrote this film, or was that just something that came about later on? No, it was definitely uh, uh, given before I started working the script, working on the script, uh, I wanted to have this film contained to one location so we could film it in two weeks and, and not spend too much money uh, going from one location to the other. I, I prefer to focus on the characters and the story and not have to run around and, and uh, spend too much money uh, going to different places. So yeah. it was definitely a given. And what's that like for a cast and crew when you're working just in the one location? Do you see it as a positive or a negative? Well, it has both. Um, it was a very strange experience because most of us lived in the house during two weeks. So uh, I, I was I was uh, sleeping exactly in the room where the whole film, uh, well, most of the film takes place. I was sleeping on the couch in that very room that you see uh, for two weeks. And the actors were sleeping upstairs and the uh, the crew members, most of them were sleeping in the house too. And two of them were just see, sleeping a few miles away in a... In, in, a, in a camp, but it was a very immersive experience. The, the actors, the six actors, were all sleeping in two bedrooms, so it, it brought them together. I think it, it created a bond that is very hard to replicate when everyone goes back to the hotel each night. Yeah, you do get that sense in the film that the cast were very tight as well. And speaking of the cast, can you tell us a little bit about how you've been able to, to put this cast together? But well, we had a casting call because uh, we had absolutely none of the actors uh, when I wrote the script. And I wrote the script in a very open way so that each role could be um, adapted to the, the personality of the actor who would uh, show up. And we had this casting call where we auditioned, well, I think we had 300 submissions and we auditioned something like 30, 30 or 35 people. 
and we ended up uh, choosing six people who we think uh, worked together really well, uh, which was the, the, the idea. We needed people to be uh, complementary and to, uh, uh, to, yeah, to complement each other. And we had these six people who didn't know each other before and had to uh, create a bond in, in something like two or three weeks before we, we took up for filming. And the, the strange thing is, one of them had to be replaced, because the guy who played the American guy was supposed to be uh, this uh, very funny uh, half-Indian guy from San Francisco who had to drop out, to drop out due to visa, visa issues, and we had to replace him a few days before filming. And Peter showed up, and he's not American, but he played a half-American, half-Islandic character. And and he, he was great. He just showed up on the first day of filming. I had a Skype with him before, but no one had ever seen him before. And he had to do this first scene where he slaps the girl, uh, the girl's uh, bottom. And it was a very good introduction to uh, him meeting the rest, of, the rest of the cast. And then everything went out really well. Now, I was going to ask you about that. I love the idea that you've got people from different nationalities playing the characters. So you've got an Italian girl, an Australian guy, French guy etc etc where did that idea come from because that joel so well in the film well, it started as uh, at first i just wanted to have french and american characters because i wanted to film in english but in france so the idea was to have a few french characters bringing in american characters to this place and then they would speak in english but there would be this french element to the script with the location and the french characters and when we started auditioning actors i realized that i i had british actors that had this Australian actor and people from all over the world and it was um, much more interesting and stimulating to have characters from six different countries and we ended up picking six different countries and eventually we, we ended up giving the, uh, the the part of an Italian character to a French Spanish girl so it doesn't really matter but I, I like the idea of making that international and we, we slipped in a few references to their uh, to their respective countries. Yeah, I love the fact that that happened because one of the things that really stood out for me in the film was all of a sudden I was hearing the Australian national anthem um, being whistled. Did the idea come to you straight away to have an Australian character or was that purely just because you cast an Australian actor? That's because I cast an Australian actor who's, uh, who was really, really good and, and funny and this idea of singing the, uh, singing the uh, Australian anthem... Uh, <clears throat> came from the fact that he was supposed to whistle the Marseillaise because he was in France and he was uh, he, he starts whistling the Marseillaise and he was supposed to whistle it all the way to to the attic and halfway he said I'm sorry I, I can't I can't whistle the Marseillaise um, uh, all the way because I only know the the beginning of the of the, of the song and I can't whistle it uh, through the end I can't remember it and we tried and we tried and at some point I said can you uh, switch to the Australian anthem? And he says, oh, yes, I know that, of course. And he switches when his mind switches to going to the to the attic. And I think that the scene is a lot better than for, that was first intended. Yeah. Now, we do have a lot of screenwriters and young filmmakers who listen to this show. I was just wondering, could you give us a little bit of an insight to when you were sitting down and writing this script into how much thought goes into what exactly is the horror? So in this case, it's the, the VHS machine. How much thought goes into that as a character in itself, as the machine, and how do you transcribe that onto your screenplay? Well, the horror element was something that, that um, grounded the project because I wanted to be a horror movie because it's a commercial, commercial genre and because I love it. And we had the six characters slowly uh, sinking into a supernatural world, but it takes almost a whole movie to get to real horror scenes which arrive in the end and are the, uh, the climax of what has happened before. So it's a very organic process. It, in, at first, it was supposed to be uh, an action-packed uh, horror film, and it became a character-oriented, almost comedy, turning uh, gradually into a horror movie. So yeah. it's, it's very, very organic. It's a film that evolved during, during filming and even during the uh, editing process. Yeah, now you've got some great special effects in this film as well. Can you tell us a little bit about how you put those special effects together? Yeah, the, the, as I said, the special effects girl didn't show up on the set. So what we did is we uh, we shot the scenes uh, with the idea that we could insert um, special effects inserts afterwards, and we filmed them a few months after principal photography. We we did a small crowdfunding campaign to raise a bit of money, 
and we hired a very, very good special effects artist in France called Denis Gastou and Jean-Christophe Spadaccini, who worked on, on very big uh, French movies, and they did these very short, striking special effects, uh, practical special effects shots. And then we had someone add a few uh, visual effects in scenes that, that really uh, enhanced the scene. But that was done, uh, yeah, that, that was very, done very late in the process. And there was this ghost uh, coming out of the TV scene that was really a, a, a blend of uh, t- taking a very old movie from the 50s and uh, using very recent technology to make him walk into the room. And the, the film, the original film from the 50s, is very, very cheesy. And I think the scene in which we see the monster come out of the TV is very creepy. And it's uh, one of the things I like, taking something that's cheesy and make it work in a, in a different way. Exactly. Now, one of the things that also stood out for me as well, being a, a heavy metal fan and also an alternative music fan, was your soundtrack. Can you tell us how you put the soundtrack together and what made you choose the tracks that you chose? Well, the, the, the opening and, and uh, closing songs are by a French group called The, the Outburst. Uh, they sing in English, but they're, they're clearly French. And uh, I used a, a song of theirs a few years ago in a short movie that I did. And so I knew them, and I knew there were these two songs that I really liked, and I thought worked well as opening and closing songs because of their tones. And uh, so, I, so I contacted them, and I used these songs that were composed, I think, in 2005. 2004, I mean, a few years ago. And the rest of the soundtrack is by uh, my composer, Mathieu Huvelin. And um, I know he, he tried from time to time to move closer to the uh, heavy metal tone of the opening credit. Like with this scene, this montage scene where the characters all set in the house. He did a first music that was very uh, circus-like, very com- comedic. And I said, well, I think it doesn't work. And he said, well, I'm going to move to something a bit more uh, rock-like, a bit drier and something a bit closer to what uh, you can hear in the opening song. Okay, now, we are almost out of time, Godier, but I wanted to ask one last question before we go. I noticed on IMDb that uh, there's been an announcement now that Sherlock Holmes vs. Frankenstein is going ahead as a feature. Can you tell us where you're up to with that at the moment? Uh, We filmed a few minutes of that uh, with an actor that you might know called Shane Bryant, who was in old Hammer films like Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, who was Peter Cushing's assistant. And he's a British actor living in Australia, actually. And he flew over to Paris to film a few scenes with us. So we have something like five or six minutes of Sherlock Holmes versus Frankenstein. And now we're we're, uh, assembling the finance for the rest of the film, which is a much uh, more expensive movie than House of VHS. So it's a bit complicated to uh, assemble the, the budget. But we are supposed to film uh, next year in Belgium, and hopefully it will be a, an epic movie. Okay, well there you go, listeners. You can expect to see Sherlock Holmes versus Frankenstein in the future, but right now you can go out and grab a copy of House of VHS, which is available on DVD and on demand as well. Gordia, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Dave, and thank you to uh, Bounty Films, who put the film out on, on DVD in Australia. Thank you to them and to Leslie Morris.